Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Gartner, double board certified plastic surgeon. Ever wonder why it's so dangerous to step on a rusty nail? Well, stay tuned. We're going to figure it out with this next video. In the fifth century, Greek physician Hippocrates, creator of the Hippocratic Oath, was sailing with a very ill shipmaster. The captain was suffering a nasty infection that caused his jaws to press together, his teeth to lock up, and the muscles in his neck and spine to spasm. Hippocrates dutifully recorded these symptoms, but he was unable to treat the mysterious disease. And six days later, the shipmaster succumbed to his illness. Today, we know this account to be one of the first recorded cases of tetanus. And thankfully, modern physicians are much more prepared to handle this peculiar infection. Yes, thank God, because uh, that was a killer back then in those days. It's been around, obviously, as you see here for a long time, but no one knew what it was. Now we know it's a bacterial infection caused by Clostridium tetani. And with the development of antibiotics and vaccines in the 20s, now we can control this if it's caught early enough. There are still, unfortunately, some people who still die from this. Unlike other common bacterial infections like tuberculosis and strep throat, tetanus doesn't pass from person to person. Instead, the offending bacterium, known as Clostridium tetani, infects the body through cuts and abrasions. These infection sites are why tetanus is so strongly associated with rusty nails and scrap metal, which can cause such wounds. Hides in dirt, sometimes old leaves that can stay dormant there for quite a long time, and even manure from animals. So if you're working outside in dirt, leaves, or any of that thing, you should always be wearing gloves. Uh, if you're vaccinated, you have some protection, but still even with that, you should always be wearing some type of protection from your hands and other protection so you don't try and scrape yourself with dirt in it. But the condition's connection to rust is actually much less direct. Clostridium tetani bacteria are often found in soil, manure, and dead leaves, where they can survive for years in the form of spores, even amidst extreme heat and dryness. These piles of organic material can sit undisturbed for long periods, potentially concealing old metal, which rusts over time. And so if this gets in a fresh wound, cut, puncture, or burn, that's where basically it can start spreading and causing the infection. So if someone does blunder into this environment and cuts themselves, it would likely increase their odds of infection, especially since rusty metal can create jagged wounds with lots of deoxygenated dead tissue. So especially if the wound has some dead tissue in it, that's where these bacteria can ferment. For them to latch onto. Once in the body, the spores begin to germinate. This process releases several toxins, including deadly tetanus toxin. Nerve endings soak up this toxin, drawing it into the brain and spinal cord, where it wreaks havoc on interneurons. Mostly affects the nervous system and can affect muscle contractions in the later stages. Typically, these work alongside motor neurons to regulate our muscle actions, from endeavors as complex as kicking a ball to those as simple as breathing. But by blocking neurotransmitters released by interneurons, tetanus toxin causes uncontrollable muscle contractions and spasms. Typically, within seven to 10 days of infection, patients begin experiencing general aches, trouble swallowing, and lockjaw. Right, so you can have muscle spasms, painful and involuntary, breathing problems, because we use our muscles to help us breathe. You can have other symptoms such as fever, sweating, rapid heartbeat, and uh, seizures even. The head and neck tend to show symptoms first, but as the toxin spreads, stronger muscle groups become more rigid, leading to a frightening arching of the back. That's really classical when you see these people uh, suffering from tetanus like 100 years ago. They're like classically locked into this bizarre gymnastics position where they're arching their back tremendously. But that's something when you have this infection, you can't help at, that, at those later stages of the disease. Left untreated, these spasms become more extreme, eventually seizing the muscles in the windpipe and chest, leading patients to suffocate within 72 hours of symptoms appearing. Without treatment, tetanus has an extremely low rate of survival. But fortunately, medical professionals have developed a robust plan to handle a tetanus diagnosis. First, doctors clean the infected wound and administer antibiotics. So you want to clean with like peroxide, alcohol, betadine. Peroxide and alcohol seem to clean out things the best. That's why everybody pours whiskey on a wound in those movies, because there's uh, a lot of truth to that killing the bacteria and preventing further toxin production. 
Then, they inject antitoxin to neutralize any tetanus toxin still in the body that has yet to enter the central nervous system. This works well if you catch it early enough. Finally, patients begin a several-week period of supportive care, which can include muscle relaxants to stop spasms and ventilators to prevent suffocation. Yeah, that's a late stage to try and prevent it from progressing. If you're on a ventilator, you're definitely in deep trouble. In the days of Hippocrates, the only course of treatment was to wait and hope. But now, we know the best time to tackle Clostridium tetany is before an infection even takes place. Correct. That's why vaccinations were a game changer for these illnesses, because they're very difficult to treat if they're later stages. Tetanus vaccines, originally developed in the early 1920s, are crucial to preventing tetanus and stopping its spread. Experts recommend a series of shots and boosters beginning at two months old and ending around age 12. Yet over 20,000 infants still die of tetanus every year. That's because, you know, kids run around, they crawl, they're in dirt on the sandbox and all that, get splinters. So it's crucial for children to have this. In the United States, there aren't many people affected by this because the vaccinations are so well. But there are in the United States about 10 people a year who still die of this. Mostly in low and middle income countries where vaccine access is limited, including South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And newborn babies are especially at risk if their mothers are unvaccinated as Clostridium tetany can infect a newborn's umbilical stump. Right, so when they cut the cord, if that's not sterile, there could be tetanus toxin on there and cause issues. Though vaccinating mothers during pregnancy can help with this problem. The fact is, tetanus remains a significant threat to human health. So people should get vaccinated and take measures to prevent infection after cutting themselves, whether it's on a rusty nail or a 2,400-year-old ship anchor. So protect yourself, wear gloves out there if you can do any handy work and protect the rest of your body. So if you like these type of videos, there'll be more on the way. Hit the subscribe and like button and we'll see you next time.